Good. Well, today we commence a brand new series called Unbreakable Faith. And I want to start with a, a lesson in ancient history. Is that okay? Yeah. Ancient history. Uh, because if you ask my kids, when they hear the year 1978, they think ancient history. <laughs> I mean, I, I say to them, yeah, the first LP I ever bought was LP. <laughs> you know, what's, what's uh, an LP or a cassette? You know, if I should have brought a cassette this morning for those who know. But, uh, you know, if you said to the young person who had a cassette and a pencil, do you know what the connection is between these two? <laughs> You know, don't you? Even James, you know what the connection is between a cassette and a pencil? Absolutely, Absolutely yeah. But in 1978, a German-based band uh, had a chart sensation with uh, the song, By the Rivers of Babylon. Do you remember that song? Yeah. By the rivers of Babylon. Okay, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> but what most people who sang this song didn't realize was that it didn't come from the secular charts. It actually came from the Old Testament charts. It came from one of the Psalms, Psalm 137. And in Psalm 137, verse 1, it says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. My goodness, that's very biblical language. What's Zion? Okay, Jerusalem, right? Mount Zion. So that's what they remember, remembering Jerusalem. Now, thankfully, the Psalms aren't like country and western songs, um, you know, but are a record of, I suppose, the, of God's people's prayers. That's, I suppose, what they are. Um, uh, people responding to situations and their emotions and their feelings about the ups and downs of life. And if you don't know what to pray on certain occasions, then just get the, the Bible out, get the Psalms out, and there'll be something if you're happy, and there'll be a lot of stuff if you're sad. And if, and if, Bad people are actually seem to be doing better than you. There's going to be a stack of ones <laughs> where you can just get along with the psalmist and say, why are they prospering? And I'm doing the right thing and everything's going parachute for me at the moment. And in 586 BC, unfortunately, Chris isn't here to share about that this morning. Chris and Carl will be back next week. But in 586 uh, BC, the superpower of Assyria... Um, exiled the people of Jerusalem, of Zion, into slavery to Babylon. Now, where's Babylon? Iraq. Okay, so they were exiled into slavery to modern-day Iraq, and the walls of the city were destroyed. And, and God's people lived by the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, and they wept because not only did they miss their homeland, but they wept with tears because in their minds, the only way that they could experience God's presence was to be in God's temple. And that's what we were sharing this morning. You know, it's God's presence, not having an answer for everything, but it's God's presence that's actually going to make all the difference in our lives. And so they were weeping because they just couldn't, not, not only had they been ripped out of there, but they just couldn't envisage how they were going to encounter God anymore in a strange land. They were foreigners and they were oppressed and it was a hard time. But the great news is that not everybody was reaching for antidepressants because it sounds like they were on antidepressants here, doesn't it? You know, by the rivers of Babylon, how we wept. Poor me. They had a victim mentality, you know. Poor me, poor me, poor me another one. Yeah. And the Bible uh, records that not everybody had that victim mentality because the Bible records the story of Daniel and his three friends who were, I suppose, some of the first to have been taken into captivity to Babylon about 20 years before this. So uh, Judah and Jerusalem had been coming under a series of, of, atta of, of attacks. And these young guys had been taken off into captivity and, and in spite of the pressure to conform and, and as, in spite of the pressure to compromise, these young men, probably as 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, they had an unbreakable faith. Whilst most wept, they worshipped. Whilst many grumbled, they grew in their uh, knowledge of God. They, uh, they grew in their love of God. They grew in their fear of God and not fear of man. 
You place people in identical situations. Some will sink. Others will swim. Some will recoil, where others, like cream, will, will rise to the surface. And this series that we're going to be on between really now and Christmas to the first or second week in uh, December is, is going to give us great insight in, into the situation that many of us find ourselves in today. Because today, I don't, I don't know about you, but you know, faith is under pressure. Our Christian lives are under pressure. And I want, like these young men, to have an unbreakable faith. An unbreakable faith. No matter what the pressure, no matter what the uh, call to compromise is, I would want to be one of those types of men and women that stands strong and has an unbreakable faith. That says, like, I believe our God can deliver us, but even if our God doesn't deliver us, I'm not going to cave in to the pressure that's around me. So let's read from Daniel chapter 1, and probably just the first seven verses today. And in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay, that's pretty simple. Judah was the lower part of Israel. You had ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. Israel in the north, think of it that way, Judah, Benjamin in the south. And the Lord delivered... Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of the, sorry, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter into the king's service. And among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, it may feel as if you've all gone back in time. Maybe you all feel you're in the British Museum. If you've been to the British Museum, you'll uh, see artifacts from this period of time. However, I think that the pressures that followers of Jesus have um, throughout the ages have changed very little. The surroundings and the circumstances might have changed, but the challenges that followers of Jesus face actually today are uncannily quite similar as to those days. We are probably experiencing the fastest rate of change in the British Isles from a culture that was heavily influenced by Judeo-Christian principles to one that is very secular. Wouldn't you agree it's a very secular culture now? that we're living in, and in some instances seems to be actually quite aggressive towards Christianity. And of course, in the last decade, it's become more and more apparent. Certain newspapers have highlighted some stories where those who are overtly Christian seem to be um, under the spotlight, or you might use the word persecuted, but be careful with that word, because we're not persecuted, but Things are a, a lot harder, like people, you know, the, the, the court cases where, you know, staff BA weren't allowed to wear symbols of a cross that identified them as Christians. Uh, it's, it's likely now that the UK courts will no longer have a Bible. The judges or uh, organization are discussing this in the next month. There'll no longer be a Bible there to, for a Christian to swear on if that's what they choose to do. I think in the Isle of Man, you can either just make an oath or you can swear in the Bible, but so as not to uh, 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 antagonize atheists who said, well, let's just take the Bible out, and then there's nothing there whatsoever. And of course, I think it's in the girl guides, they have now taken the oath to God out of uh, the wording, you know, pledging, uh, not pledging allegiance to God, but anyway, God's name in their oath. The scouts have been recently reviewing this. I don't know if Greg's up to date. Actually, I think they're going to do something slightly better. Uh, is it out as well? I had read a report that they're going to do a compromise deal with a little opt-out clause 
whereby Christians could still swear to God, and atheists, you know, etc. But that's the type of thing that's uh, going on. You know, as Christians, we're all for allowing others to the freedom to hold and practice their beliefs. You do, you do, you know, you do know that. We're, we're here for people from a different background or different views or worldview or whatever it is. We're all for allowing people the freedom in, a, in our society to do that. But you know what? We're, the reality is we're living at a time when if you hold to Orthodox Christian beliefs, that more often than not, you're going to be labeled a bigot. I mean, for instance, when the UK government, uh, Westminster, were discussing their latest marriage bill and the redefinition of marriage, at the time, you know, there was great pains to say, look, every view is valid, and, that's, and so Christians were able to speak. But within months of that, at the Lib Dem conference, Nick Clegg, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, was saying that those who voted against that were dinosaurs and bigots. So that's the way culture is changing at the moment. The new religion, you know what the new religion of the British Isles is? Political correctness. And there's tolerance for almost every viewpoint, to be honest, except for the Christian viewpoint. Because we believe in absolutes, that God doesn't change, that God's word doesn't change. But we're not here to regulate society. Get that right. You know, we're not, that's not why the church is here. We're actually here to be a holy people, to show to the world what it looks like to be a people living under God. Now, if you think the climate is changing here, and I could have shared some more stories around that, but if you think the climate is changing here for what it means to be a Christian and the pressures coming along inside you, it's nothing compar in comparison to what's happening across the world. That's why we cannot have a victim mentality or a persecution complex or anything like that, because across the world it's a nightmare. I mean, more Christians are dying for their faith now than at any other time in history. Two to three Sundays ago in Pakistan, uh, there was over 140 now Christians died in that one incident. We have somebody from Egypt here, and this person will be able to tell you, I'm not saying names because it's on the podcast, um, that uh, you know, within a matter of days, 70 churches were burnt down in Egypt. Many Christians uh, killed as well. In, in Syria, bishops and priests uh, and Christians have been summarily executed also. Um, in Iraq, it's a bloodbath there. The amount of Christians living in Iraq nowadays is tiny in comparison to what there, be, what there used to be. So if, you've, if you read Andrew um, White's new book, Andrew White has the nickname uh, the Bishop of Bag Baghdad. He's in an Anglican canon there in the Anglican church in Baghdad. On a daily basis, people are being killed in his church. Yet, on the other hand, God is moving as God has never moved before in that nation as well. Just last week, two Egyptian Christians were martyred in Libya. Just in the last few days, other Christians were taken hostage at gunpoint point and forced, well, they didn't, but forced to recant their faith and become Muslims in, in Pakistan. And it's interesting, the Western government that has helped remove many of these evil dictators, and they are evil dictators, seem to be largely silent when it comes to what's happening to Christians in the Middle East in these new regimes. It's a nightmare. I mean, if yeah, there's a great story yesterday of that uh, Muslim gentleman whose wife and family were murdered in England and then they were buried in Dublin. Great example of a, a, of a lovely Muslim man. In, uh, he, he's a doctor. He's in practicing in Dublin. You can check that out on Sky News. But I can tell you that if mosques were burnt to the ground, the British government wouldn't be quiet. And so we're actually living in a context where things are changing. Things are changing faster than ever anyone would ever imagine. And someone's once said, you know, Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what's in us until you put us in the hot water. So what is in us? Well, the great news is that in 1 John 4 and 4 says, you dear children are from God and have overcome the world because, the, let's say this together, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. And that's an amazing promise, isn't it? 
The one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. We don't need to have fear. We don't need to adopt a, a persecution complex or have a siege mentality or a victim mentality. You know, Jesus warned his disciples, persecution, troubles, hard time, they're all coming. I don't go looking for them, <laughs> but the reality is that's what comes to the family of God. They're a given. But the other thing which we need to hold on tight to is that we do not need to capitulate during times of testing. We can overcome because we have an overcomer living in us. And that's what we need to hold on to. But you know, when culture is coming all around us, like these young men, Daniel and uh, Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael, that in a foreign culture with so many pressures and everything anti, everything they'd ever learned, that they could stand strong and live for God. And so from the for story of Daniel, I'm just really giving you an introduction to this series today. Uh, I may hopefully not sound too much like a history lesson, but I just want to highlight four common ways that you and I will experience this type of pressure in our lives. Because if you have the heads up now, then when it comes knocking to your door, you'll be a lot wiser. So can we do that this morning? Yeah. That's good. Well, well, the first, week, the first thing you need to realize is that secular culture, really, is trying to destroy our heritage. Look at what happens here. In the third year, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. You know, as I said, Assyria was a superpower at the time. It had conquered nations going right far south as, as Egypt. And with its overwhelming power, it had led siege to Jerusalem. And I suppose in, in laying siege to this great city on a hill, it was restricting the freedom and the life and the movement of its inhabitants. So Jerusalem, or Zion, is under a stranglehold. Its long heritage is under threat. Now, what about us today? Doesn't it feel a little bit similar today? Now, what I do need to say to you is that you do know it's, it's God's will never to have Christian countries. You do know that. I get wound up all the time with people that kind of say to me, this is a Christian nation as if we want to have, we do not want to have a Christian nation. You do know that. You do know that. People are looking at me blankly. God has a bigger vision than a Christian nation. It's called the kingdom of God. You got that? We're not kind of, that's why we don't kind of don't see, you know, state church and stuff like that. It's not about having a Christian nation. It's about the kingdom of God coming on earth. God's rule coming on earth. We were never supposed to be, you know, we're not, our goal isn't a Christian nation, but throughout the British Isles, this Christian heritage, which we do value, is under threat. And what you need to understand is it's not the average Muslim or Hindu that... Uh, is picking on what many Christians hold dear, but rather militant atheists. So if you read Dawkins, you know, for anybody, for a Christian or anybody religious, you know, Dawkins will say things like, well, bringing up your child with a faith is akin to child abuse. That's the type of language. And I'm not making this up. You know, I read Dawkins stuff. So that's the type of culture that we're living in. Do you know that, you know, people are trying to destroy this Christian heritage. And they're very evangelical about it, if I can use that word. They're very evangelical about it. You see, the secular philosophy that we have all around us isn't willing to tolerate people holding different viewpoints. I mean, secular culture talks about let's be tolerant of everyone, but when you say to somebody like Mr. Nick Clegg, well, actually, I don't believe that is the best plan Actually, people like that won't be tolerant of your opinion. And so they seek to uh, remove many things that we hold dear um, as Christians from our, from our heritage. So simple things, I don't know whether, you know, you've seen many people uh, have to go to tribunals maybe because they asked to pray for a patient or something like that, or wearing crosses. There been stories all over... Uh, the uh, summer of different street preachers. I'm not into street preaching per se. I'm thinking you need a lot of wisdom in that, but quite a lot of instances of Christian street preachers being arrested because, you know, people in the street just simply start making allegations against them and 
Maybe they're, they're released within a day or something like that, but this is actually happening in, in the UK. You know, people just don't want to hear the Christian point of view. So just be aware of that. You know, the culture we're living in is seeking to destroy our heritage, but don't be, you know, don't be a victim, please. Just be aware. And I'm sure each of us can think of different ways in our own lives that that's uh, coming across. And also it seeks to deconstruct our faith. And the Lord delivered uh, Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of Babylon. And these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth is going on there? Well, in those days, whenever one army conquered another people, they would take the statues of the gods and they would place the statues or sacred items uh, into their God's temple. It was a sign like we have won, you know, our God's bigger than your God, yeah? I think if you, if you remember in the early chapters of Judges, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, isn't that right? And they take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it into the temple of Dagon, I think it was a fish god. But what would happen every single day is that the Ark of the Covenant wouldn't change, but Dagon would be flat, remember? You know, it would be flat on his face. So, and here they just took away a few items, just symbolically, that were used in the worship of the God of Israel just to humiliate the people. And later in Daniel chapter 5, when we get there, you see that the king at that time uses some of these special items and the wild parties that he's having. But and so the, I think the lesson that we learn here is that it's not that forces against Christianity uh, are going to come and try to wipe out Christianity in one, little, in one big foul swoop, but rather they're going to come and remove some perceived small things bit by bit. You got that? So it's not going to be an overnight, because you know, the pressure doesn't come just overnight. It's going to be little by little. Things that we took for granted, like being able to go into schools, being able to talk about Jesus. That's what we see. Little by little, things are removed. And you may think at the time, well, it's only one thing that's gone. But it's little by little, a drip feed. I wonder, equally personally, what little things have you allowed the enemy to take out of your life? Because equally, when somebody goes AWOL in the Christian faith, it, isn't the, it, isn't, it doesn't start with the big things. It's the little things the enemy takes. Time, treasure, you know, start putting the treasure. What I allow myself to be exposed to, what I watch, what I read, what I hear, it's, it's just little by little. And then, uh, as that's happening, this kind of oppressing culture around God's people often seeks to reconstruct our values. So taking things away, and then it'll start to put new values upon us. This is what Christians believe. This is what the church should believe. And again, it was never the king's plan, the Babylonian king's plan, to actually ever reign in Jerusalem. What, what they did in those days was they set up puppet regimes. They set up vassal states. Uh, and so they needed to put uh, leaders in place who, if you cut them down the middle, um, would uh, reveal um, their values, their, their religious views, and stuff like that. But also people, a bit like Herod at the time of, of Jesus, who would identify with those on the ground as well. So Daniel and his three friends, they're probably from the royal household, probably um, nobility stock. Um, they're pure, they're um, healthy, they're prime candidates to be future rulers on behalf of the Babylonians. And so uh, you could say that they're enrolled in a fast-track master's program. That's what's going on here. Right, we want to get these young guys, only 15, 16, 17 at the moment, we want to get them indoctrinated in everything that we believe. They have this Jewish culture. They'll be prime candidates. If we can just poof, put all of our stuff in them, they'll be prime candidates, actually, to be some of the leading lights back in Judah. So we read here in Daniel 1, 3 to 5, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. 
And he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, and the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter into the king's service. So they're on this fast-track master's program to be able to um, lead people in the way of Babylon, yet be able to look like good little Jewish boys at the same time. You know, it's interesting today, one of the biggest concerns that you hear from Christian parents is when their kids leave the nest and go to university. Is that right? Um, every nation where uh, some of our friends, uh, our, our, the church family they're part of, they're, one of their philosophies is change the campus, change the world. Isn't that right? One of their focuses is let's get onto the university campuses because if you change the campus, that's where the future leaders are going to be. You change the world. But uh, the Gospel Coalition, interestingly, just very recently did a survey on how young people responded in going to university. And what they've actually discovered is that the majority of young, people, young Christian people now, okay, now, not surveys 20 years ago, but the majority of Christian young people nowadays going to university are 2.7 times more likely to grow stronger in their faith than to be weaker in their faith. And I think that should kind of help us as parents. You know, we kind of look at the culture that there is around us that uh, if we train our kids in the way they'll go, then when we do send them off to university, you know, we don't need to be paranoid or uh, anxious all the time. Yes, there are pitfalls to watch out for, but many more are being strengthened on are being great advocates for Christianity. I love it. So many are living hope young people, you know, that when they're at university and writing about, you know, what they're doing and how they're reaching out to others, there's great opportunities. That's where our young people need to be not wrapped in cotton wool. They need to go to the darkest places so that they can be light there. But I do give a word of caution. I mean, we do need to engage with our world, but we all need help. I'm not being arrogant here and saying, well, you know, if you just send your kids out there, everything's going to be sweet. Because, you know, I think one of uh, the, le- I mean, I'm going to give a little bit of personal testimony. One of the leading lights, I would say, in the British church in the, in the 80s was Steve Chalk. Anybody ever heard of Steve Chalk? Baptist pastor, etc., you know, and uh, certainly he was very influential in the people that I uh, hung around with, and Steve had a real, has had a real gift for media, and uh, he always found his way on the UK TV, he was always on uh, GM TV, which is ITV's breakfast time uh, program. Over the years, he became uh, like a, the most popular guest, I suppose, Christian guest, the number 10, but I can tell you, friends that I have in the UK saw it coming. Because the problem is, you can't really get immersed in that culture. You really can't. And expect nothing to change in you. And so unfortunately, I, I think Steve Chalk today is one of those great examples of somebody who's gone way off the rails. You know, anything at number 10, thankfully it's a foreign government we're talking about. You didn't know, yeah, you know. Anything that number 10 comes out with, you know, that's, liberal and wooly regarding Christianity. Steve's the first to put his, you know, rubber stamp on it. Like a nodding dog, I suppose. And unlike our four young heroes, he allowed his faith to be reconstructed by secular thinking. So we do need to be careful. I'm, I'm, I'm here being uh, encouraging and confident and saying, you know, that, you know, we can send our young people to university. We shouldn't be paranoid. But uh, it's great to see some back as well. Yeah, Sarah, on scale from university. Yeah. And more passionate for Jesus than ever before. But none of us in our own lives can underestimate the pressures that there are around us. I mean, imagine the pressure. These four young guys, they've come from a strict Jewish home. And all of a sudden, they're finding themselves in a foreign place, they're removed from their family, and they're subjected to the intensive teaching of Babylonian literature. They're going to be forced to study the occult. They're going to be forced to study astrology and all sorts of things. But the reality is we have similar pressures. And it is like the proverbial story of the frog in the, in the water. You do know that one, John, about the frog in the water, that you just heat the water up a little by little by little by little, and it doesn't notice until the end. It's gone. And so we need to be aware 
of this in our lives as well. You know, that it's not the overnight thing. It's just the little by little by little things that we would never dreamt of saying, doing, places we would never have dreamt of going. Little by little by little. And all of a sudden, we have adopted a way of living which is far from the ways of God. And lastly, just, is this helping at all this morning? Yeah. You've all gone quiet, yeah. <laughs> lastly, uh, you know, secular culture, really what it's trying to do is undermine our identity. <coughs> Among those who were chosen from, some from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief gave them new names to Daniel, Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. What's in a name? Well, everything's in a name. I mean, the people of Israel are descended from somebody, Shem. Isn't that right? Shem was one of the sons of Noah. And his, Shem's name means name. Yeah. Everything's in a name. You know, as parents, we think carefully about the name we give our kids. Anybody named their kid Judas recently? <laughs> Any young adults out there? Okay, we think carefully about the names we're going to give our kids. Because when you hear that name, ah, so when we call Phoebe, Phoebe, it was because Romans 16, there was a leader in the church, a deacon in the church, Phoebe. So it's, I wanted to be like that. Anna, who's probably out of the, this morning. Caitlin got Caitlin. <laughs> Just trying to be trendy at that time. Anna, you know, daughter of Phanuel, tribe of Asher. Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 2 or something like that, isn't it? Luke 2. And she's a prophetess. You know, you, names are very important. Jesus, when he met people, you know, I'm going to change your name. I, I'm going to give you a new identity. People knew you as this, but actually from now on, ah, you're going to be like that. I know it's not obvious from the English text, all these names had special meanings. So the Hebrew names that these young guys were given were all to do with the God of their family and of their land. So Daniel, God is my judge. Yeah. But then come along the Babylonians and say, we're going to change your name to Belteshazzar. Baal, protect the king. Baal is one of their false gods. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious. Imagine having the name, the Lord is gracious. Jonathan, doesn't that mean God's gift? Yeah. <laughs> the Lord is gracious. But he becomes Shadrach, command of Aku. He was the Sumerian uh, sun god. Mish uh, Mishael, who is like the Lord? Imagine that. Every time you meet him, who is like the Lord? Every time, every context, who is like the Lord? But this culture wants to give him a new identity, Meshach. Who is what Aku is? Azariah, the Lord is my helper. Every time you meet him, every day, <laughs> the Lord is my, is an evangelist. He was an evangelist without any time anybody said his name is like an evangelist, you know. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my, okay. The Lord is my helper. Abed Nigo, servant of Nebo. It was another pagan god. You see, our identity is to be firmly rooted in Jesus. That's who we are. We are sons and daughters of God. That is our identity. That's why even in the, in the church, we're trying to flip the church. There were no Pastor Jonathans in the New Testament church. There were no Apostle Pauls in the New Testament church. There was Jonathan who functioned as a pastor. Paul who functioned as, so it's not about, you know, my identity isn't in a title, if you understand. For all of us, it's about I'm a servant of God who functions in this way. But we kind of live in a world that people want to get their identity from titles rather than we often say from titles. So our identity is that we are a, a royal priesthood. That's who we are. We are a holy nation. We are uh, a people who belong to God. And because that's our identity, that's how we're going to live. 
We are a holy people, a holy nation. And so we're going to live holy lives. That's our identity. Uh, but I don't know if you've discovered, but se the, the secular world wants to label you based on your sexual orientation. You know, I am what? <laughs> you know, it's not right. Are you this or are you that? But that's not, I mean, that's why when I, we have many people that we love getting alongside to struggle with their sexual identity. And we say, you know, stop labeling yourself uh, regarding your what you think at the moment your sexual orientation may be. And it's not about that. Your identity is who you are in Christ. You know, Gordon works for Stars, and uh, we really value the work of Alcoholics Anonymous as well. But there is a weakness with Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when you go into an AA meeting, you say, hello, my name's Gordon, and I'm a... I'm a... Huh? That is my identity, if I, if I put my trust in Jesus. I may be a saint who struggles with alcohol, but my identity is, I'm a saint. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. See you with me? I don't mean to give AA a hard time because they do a great work. But actually, there's a, there's a better way. It's that we get our identity in who am I in Christ. And I'm loved and I'm, I'm valuable and I'm a, I'm a son of God. So it isn't about my sexual orientation, which, which kind of pigeonholes me, or gender, or race, or wealth. We're not allowed those labels to stick to us. So when Paul wrote to churches, he wrote to the saints. He wasn't thinking of what some of us think of because of backgrounds. He's writing to you. you. When the saints go marching in, you're the saints. I'm the saints. I have a new position in Christ. I am now holy. I may struggle with certain things, but I'm now holy. And the name we bear is Jesus. That's what the Bible describes. We carry His name. We carry, and everything's in the name. It's the person's character. We carry the name of Jesus. Now, in the next few weeks, next week I'm going to look at how to actually not compromise and give in to that type of culture. But I just wanted to spell it out this morning. But as we close this morning, then let me highlight something really good. You know, regardless of what's happening, we're not going to adopt a persecution complex or a, or a victim mentality or anything like that. Secular culture will not prevail against the church. Right. It says here, Daniel 1, verse 2, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Who allowed this to happen to the four young men and the nation of Israel? Who allowed this to happen? God. And actually, time and time again, it says in chapter 1, God gave this and God did that. So even though it appeared to be, you know, these foreign so-and-sos, actually God was allowing this. And I take great comfort in the sovereignty of God because whatever happens in my life is not beyond the reach of God. And when the, whatever the enemy tries to do and all the curveballs that come my way and everything that kind of go that just I just don't understand... They're always within boundaries established by God. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, it says in Romans 8, 28, in, in some things God works for the good of those who love Him, according to His purpose. What? All. All things. The good, the bad, the ugly. In all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. So God can take whatever the enemy wants to throw at me, you know, God relishes and just, uh, he relishes when the enemy overreaches himself and he just takes that and he works something good. So secular culture isn't going to prevail against the church because Jesus says, and I tell you, you're a Peter and on this rock of Jesus, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The kingdom of God will never be under siege. You got that? The kingdom of God will never... Because the kingdom of God is always advancing. Always advancing. Times are tough. The pressures that you're experiencing in the home and, and in the workplace and, and other places may be hard. But it's at times like this that God 
will do great things. And Jesus said, I've told you these things. So that in me, that's our identity, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have. Take that and shove it in your promise box. You know, people get these nice little promise boxes, like Bible bingo. What's my nice, you know, somebody carves up, you know, 300 nice little verses for the year, you know, and, and they kind of go, oh, what's my nice little verse? Oh, I have plans to prosper you, you know. Uh, Andrew was sharing with us and Jeremiah as well. There's another verse that says, I have plans to beat the living daylights out of you. <laughs> Nobody pins that up on their wall. <laughs> but in all things, God works for the good of those who love us. And he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So the answer to the church's challenges in the 21st century and your challenges isn't to become like a chameleon today. Isn't the blend into the background? Neither church hear this, neither is it for you to create a monastery experience for your life or your family or for the church. It's not about either. It's not either of those. I love this quote. It, is not, it isn't that we want the church out of the world, but we do want the world out of the church. You got that? It isn't that we want the church out of the world, but we do want the world out of the church. Jesus hasn't called us to live an isolated life in a monastery, but he's called us to live an insulated life in the world. He says, I'm sending you into the world. Now, some of us, I'm sure today, are experiencing pressures to compromise than never before. Anybody experiencing pressures to compromise, pressures to cut corners? Anybody like that? All of us? And what we want to do today is to pray for everybody that's going through stuff like that. And next week, we'll actually, we'll give more practical handles. I just didn't want to rush the message. I want to give more practical handles of what these young men did when the pressure was on. And uh, we'll I'll unpack that next week. You know, uh, you and I uh, were chatting just yesterday, and we uh, read an article about that, that described 10 weird differences, sorry, 10 weird defense mechanisms of ma uh, mammals. And one of the mammals that we read about was an American opossum. What is an opossum? But I did look it on Google last night. And it's a cool little creature. It's a possum. I don't know why Americans call it an opossum. And then you go, oh, possum. Yeah. Oh, I, but it's a possum, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But, um, but if it, you can Google this today. But when this little possum, old possum, sorry, um, must maybe it's Irish, old possum. That's what it is, yeah. But anyway, when a predator comes near, what happens to this little old possum is that its body collapses to the ground, right? When an enemy comes near, its body collapses to the ground. Its gums retract, bearing its teeth. Why am I looking at Lucas here? Drool dribbles from its mouth. <laughs> and the smell of death emanates from its body. And the, uh, this whole process is inadvertent. The, the possum has no control over it. As soon as like a, uh, like a creature that it thinks is going to kill it, this is what it does. And... Uh, it's simply the body dies. And uh, most animals are after a live kill. Most of its predators. And it dies, but inside it's fully alive. And apart from the burying teeth and the dribbling and the smell, that's what followers of Jesus are called to be like. <laughs> Dead in the flesh, when all these pressures come on us, Dead in the flesh, but alive inside. And today, I, I haven't want to be. I want. I didn't want to kind of do a conspiracy theory today because there's great things in our culture as well. I didn't want to do a cons conspiracy theory today, but as we become more and more aware of how the world is trying to squeeze us into its mold, Romans 12, 1, <coughs> 2. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. So as we are sensing this pressure, we need to die to self. That 
Self will give in to those pressures. Yet remain alive to Christ. Paul talked about, I've, you know, I have died. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. So shall we stand together and just take a moment to pray over those who really are battling? I just want to generally pray for people that are, uh, we're all, you know, feeling the pressure. And uh, we want to live a life that reflects Jesus rather than a life that reflects a, a broken uh, world. And I just thought it'd be good to pray for some of us today. And maybe just some of us generally are just feeling this pressure to conform, you know, conform. You know, when it comes to, I don't want to pick the easy ones, but, you know, conform when it comes to how I respond to my sexual desires. You know, we're all wired, and we live in a world that says, you have a feeling, you know, go with your feeling. But God wants us to go with Him and to enjoy all those blessings, but within a covenant relationship, which He calls marriage. Or maybe... Uh, some of us are feeling uh, the pressures in our social life as well to be party to things that aren't God-honoring. Pressure in the workplace to do things that wouldn't honor God. I don't know what they are, but God knows what they are. And it says in Philippians that God works within us, both giving us the, the, the will and the power to do the right things. And uh, I just really want to conclude just praying over some people that uh, God already is working in you. He's, he's uh, pointing the direction that you should go, but you're wondering, have I got the strength to live the right way? Have I got the strength to do the right thing?